What up, bros? What up, bros? And welcome to Bra Meets World. What is Bra Meets World? Your boy Meets World fan cast. I'm Siege. And I'm your boy TC. All right, Tonafi, we have guests today. Yes, we are doing a very special crossover episode with uh, the guys from Tim Talk. Would you like to introduce yourself? Well, hello. hello. Uh, <laughs> by the way, your guys' intro is fantastic. Oh, thank you. So, I'm so embarrassed by it. <laughs> so, but why would you be embarrassed by it? It's amazing. It's so much better than our very like just stiff, stodgy, boring, hello, welcome to another episode. Well, there's so a lot of better. singing involved. So <laughs> This is why we don't do that. Though. I cannot sing. Can't speak for Cameron. Actually, I'm going to speak for Cameron. He can't sing either. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you guys are much better. Uh, but yeah, I'm Chris from Tim Talk. For those of you who don't know, we're a podcast about the DC animated universe co-created by Bruce Tim, thus the name. Yes. Uh, and I'm Cameron Dexter. I am the other half of Tim Talk. Uh, I am the one who doesn't know what's going on most of the time. <laughs> well, that's uh, a departure from us who regularly don't know what's going on. Okay, good. I'm mean, with like-minded folk. So, <laughs> good, like, this is great. I just think it's funny because you were like, Tim Talk, and you explained everything about it, and TC and I are like... Who wrote this episode? <laughs> yeah, that's it's fine. more of just like what we think of stuff because we do very limited research on these Boy Meets World episodes, as our fans know. But um, well, our, ours is easy because we named our podcast after the guy who does <laughs> most of the stuff on the DC universe. Yeah. So Bruce Tim, yeah, made writes. I mean, yeah, no, I'm just saying it that made it a lot easier fantastic. for us. A lot of our comments are like, did you guys like even Google? <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. If you would have done like a simple search, you would have gotten this answer. We're like, eh. <laughs> Like, that's, that's a lot of work sometimes. <laughs> Anyone who records a podcast know these things get slapped together at the last minute. Absolutely. And you always sit down and go, oh, I didn't do any research <laughs> on this. Um, that's very much the case for me today, talking about Spider-Verse. I know quite a bit about Spider-Man, just broadly speaking, but I did not look up any trivia or, like, research any of the comics or anything like that. I'm just going in, just blindly going like, oh, this was fun. I have some movie trivia, but like oh. that's, that's pretty much. So um, I will say that Chris kind of brought up what this episode is about. We're doing this crossover episode because we wanted to talk about Into the Spider-Verse. Spider-Man. Spiderman. Into the Spider-Man Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Spider-Man. Yes. <laughs> Which I just want to say, just throwing out there, maybe my favorite animated film I've seen in a very long time. Oh, I'm going to hand up to Cameron for that. <laughs> I mean, we, we've talked ad, ad nauseum about this already on our podcast. Uh, I adore this movie so much. It, 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 it's such a revolution for animation. And Absolutely. Seeing it just the... I mean, we, we've had a blend of, of kind of 3D and 2D since the 90s. I mean, Tarzan was kind of the first major film to, to bring in 3D animation with 2D laid on top of it. But this film brings it to such another level where it's it's creative, it's unique, it's so just it's just beautiful. beautiful it, it's a work of art. Is an act like that's definitely the word because rewatching it, I was like this, like just scenes feel like like any still or if you pause the movie at any point in time, it could be like a masterpiece that you would throw on your wall. Oh yeah, it's it's an art piece. Like, have you guys tried to pitch this movie to people who aren't? comic book fans 100 percent. i've tried so hard i'm just like look i know this is not your thing i know you're not into cartoons or spider-man or dimension hopping or whatever (laughs) thing you want to talk about but like from a visual perspective nothing's ever been made like this before go see it for that alone like it's groundbreaking i i i I was thinking of it as like a celebration of animation like we have all these different kinds of animation that are so beautifully um, kind of mixed together in these really untraditional ways, but in in a way that makes sense with the story. It doesn't feel like anything's just thrown in there just because. It all feels very organic. Um, and I just I, I remember me and Siege when we were watching it afterwards, we were like, you could pause any part of this movie and it would be a beautiful screensaver. Um, uh, my screensaver is actually now several versions. I like I have several different. <laughs> Computers, like a work computer, and all like they're all um, just rips of this movie. So, like, which, which are they like specific characters? Which points um, did you go it, for? It's Miles Morales, okay. Um, and it's just like him in different poses. I but I searched a long time for like scenes because the most famous one is the one they even use on the poster where it's like the upside down version of like him jumping. Uh, off the skyscraper and there's the city line but yeah. it's like reverse and it's just it's a beautiful there, beautiful so shot. that that was actually taken from another short uh which, which it has a similar look uh-huh. but it's all 2d 
um, and I, I don't remember the name of the short exactly, but it came out around 2014. It's a minute long, um, and it's about like having the strength to, to lift the earth. Uh, and it's a guy uh, on top of a building, and he does a handstand, but they flip the canvas. So it looks instead of him pushing up, it's the world moving up and him staying stationary. That's and fa- that, yeah, it, it's cool that. to see that come like into film because yes. that's just some small no name who might have actually like gotten a job because of that and it worked on the film. Yeah, you know, I did not know that. And when I saw the image of him kind of falling in New York being upside down, I thought it was more of a hey, this is a different version of Spider-Man than you know. Like, we're actually turning Spider-Man on its head and giving you something different. I didn't realize that it had this, like, unique origin, but however I interpreted it, I feel like was, like, gave me a better understanding of what they were going to do with the movie. Absolutely. I think it's really interesting because I feel like you're constantly being reminded that... This is a different interpretation. This isn't your Spider-Man. daddy Spider-Man. Yeah, this isn't your daddy Spider-Man. Well, what's funny your is daddy this... Spider-Man is old, <laughs> divorced. <laughs> <fat>. exactly. <laughs> I love how they bring that character in, uh, Peter B. Parker, because he is your dad Spider-Man. He's everything that we've known. Um, and like almost immediately, I think I realized in the first half of the movie, he goes... Um, I'm Spider-Man and I'm the only one and immediately they transition into Miles and you get like this different vibe, this different rhythm. Um, and yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Also worth noting the, the first Spider-Man we meet is basically in it through none of the rest of the movie, which is yeah. like, I, I guess he's just normally Peter Parker. I, I listened to another podcast. They kept referring to him as Peter A. Parker in contrast to Peter B. Parker. Uh, but also Chris Pine. Perfect, ca- perfect casting 100%. for that. So I was going to talk about that because talking about little trivia bits, Chris mm-hmm. Pine rounds out all the Chris's as being a superhero. This uh, is true. On a Marvel property because each other one of the famous Chris has been a superhero besides Pine. What about Walken? <laughs> Wait, he's a Christopher. Like Christopher Walken. He's a Christopher. It's he, different. He is a Christopher. All which right, is very, all right, very, very all right, different. all right. Well, we're waiting for that Chris Rock superhero movie. <laughs> oh yeah, well yeah, Chris O'Donnell. That's true. We got that. I would love right, to see who, wait, who could admit. who could Chris Rock be? Ooh. Chris Rock. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, that's a good a good one. I mean, maybe Blank Man in the 90s, but we've passed this time. <laughs> I'm just gonna go on a crazy limb. I'd love to see Chris Rock as Lex Luthor. Ooh. You know, you look, look, look you, the whole room was like, ooh. <laughs> I can see him be just yeah. like the just like the meanest plastic man. <laughs> do you guys know plastic man? I do, okay. but, but only through your podcast and Chris. Okay. So that's the one reason why. Yeah. I could see him being thrown into like a Black Panther cameo. Like oh, absolutely. Like nothing like I honestly there's not a single superhero that I, I would identify with Chris Rock. But if we're talking animation and his voice talent, that's a completely different situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now I'm what's thinking of like zebra? you like you really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really just like uh changed it. Like what's the one um Batman the animated series one with the uh, puppet? Oh, oh yeah, Scarface and the Ventriloquist. Yeah, I could just see that. I see. I could see him doing that. That would be the most like foul mouth Scarface <laughs> ever, and I would love it. I think that would make it so much more entertaining. Like they, DC has got so weird in their movies. I'm like, just embrace it now. Like, no, go like, really like, imagine weird. If they did that, you'd be like, I am so surprised, but I definitely want to see where this. But goes. I'm down <laughs> for it. How do we feel about the Riddler? Oh. He's got kind of the physique for a Riddler. He could be just, just sure. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Uh, because because he like the meaner version of Riddler is is creeper, mm-hmm. uh, but he doesn't have like the the movement of a creeper. Yeah, I would oh. imagine him being in some kind of new interpretation of the Riddler, but mm-hmm. more of like Suicide Squad like situation more than like uh, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, yeah. So so similar to how they uh, oh God, well, uh, uh, Assault on Arkham, where Riddler oh. was kind of playing a back like a background character. Sure, sure, sure. I think I think he could be there. Where he he's just there to taunt everyone and just ha- make them feel like shit the I'm whole time they're there really really enjoying this idea of like chris rock as chris the rocks Riddler. people yeah i hope you're listening because we're giving you tons of gold and so i think to, to tie it back to marvel if we had to cast him somewhere there professor x yes oh. really i don't know i just think it'd be entertaining <laughs> just a completely different version we, we've done we've done patrick stewart 
let's do something entirely different. Also, well, I don't know, like, I don't know that many Marvel characters. I'm like, ah, uh, let's just pick what the people recognize. <laughs> we're doing, we're going back to Marvel. Let's go to the ones that I have, yeah. like, a handful I have so about. Yeah. I mean, it, talking about Black Panther, I think it'd just be hilarious if he was just Chris Rock. And, Black, <laughs> and like, like, T'Challa is, is trying to learn about other cultures to, 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 to help out more. And he's like, who is this comedian? Yeah. <laughs> Can we get him here? <laughs> yeah, he, he's like... T'Challa's tour guide through the United States. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm loving this idea. I'm so uh, down for it. To, to back to your point about Peter A. Parker, mm -hmm. um, the, a question I had throughout the movie was, is this supposed to be the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man? No. And I, I realized that wasn't the case because I actually found an article where the directors were asked flat out about this. And according to io9.gizmodo.com <laughs> love, I love io9 one of my uh, faves Miller basically told them that like you know they all everything was kind of thrown on the table and discussed but really every Spider-Man could exist in their own universe in this multi-universe mm -hmm. so yes there is a universe where Peter Parker is Tobey Maguire and there's a universe where um, you know Tom Holland is, is Tobey Maguire and so forth and so forth well I mean even at the end of Venom it says in another universe yeah. which means Venom technically could connect to the Spider-Verse Right. You're gonna have to hold your <laughs> thing while we talk bite, about bite your tongue. <laughs> um, yeah, I just hope that in that other universe, Topher Grace is better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so kind of on the note of, of uh, Peter Parker, he he's supposed to embody the perfect version of Spider-Man, where everything is going his way. He's saved the city. Everyone loves him. He's married to his dream girl. Like nothing has gone wrong for him, and then you, then when we introduce Peter B. Parker, we see the more realistic side of being a superhero. Where like you you want to you uh, like I think the funniest thing, which is kind of thrown in there, is he tries to open his own Spider Man restaurant. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like TGI Spideys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it's I think that's like that that is something that would happen in real life. It, it's a Spider Man who wants to kind of profit off being Spider Man in his own way, and he's like, well, how can I do that? Investments. Uh, use my name, yeah. uh, and all of that kind of failing him. Yeah, and it's yeah. what I really lo uh, noticed during the second watch was, um, especially in this alternate universe, as you said, it's I, our generation loves realism, and you have this one where he was like, yeah, so I was working out, and it just kind of like shows him. <laughs> he was like, I was doing crunches, and I was handling it really well, and it just shows him like crying in the shower. Yeah, and I don't know what it is about our generation, but we're like, yes, <laughs> we, we can relate to. It. Well, it could be like one of the I think the best things about this movie is this theme of like anyone can be a superhero, including those people with dad bods. <laughs> yeah, now exactly. there's finally the dad bod superhero. <laughs> Not everyone can be Chris Hemsworth ripped. Exactly, as Chris. Uh, Pratt always likes to remind us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> also, I, I, I recently uh, heard the the four hot actor Chris's referred to as the christening of Hollywood. Oh, my God. I hate Ooh. that, but I love it. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've told you about the Chris's, right? No. There's there's a, a fake movie going on, on, or there's a fake movie script going around on the internet called The Chris's, where it's the four Chris's uh, in a crisis directed by Chris Nolan. Oh my God. Uh, where uh, I've never where Chris more. Walken is the main villain, <laughs> and there, there was there was one other there's one other Chris in there, but it's all just like it's a whole cast of, of both on screen and production. This is just Chris. I love in it. production. <laughs> well, hey, you just it's grab like Grip Boy One, Chris Roy, <laughs> <laughs> grab Chris Miller, one of the like the producers of this. Right there, yeah, you go. Absolutely. We have a writer for I this. I love it. Now. I think that this is great, and and it's like one of those things that I believe the internet could get done. Yeah. Also, so maybe I could get a job. If they're only, yeah, if they're only staffing Chris's. I think I have a really good bet on this one. So, and what's really, really... It's an extreme form of uh, discrimination. Exactly. Well, yeah. What makes me sad is it does not limit their pool at all. Yeah. No, it could be anybody. Anyone could be a Chris. There's so many Chris's in this town. One of the cool things I thought that this movie did was that this was the first time we saw Spider-Man outside of being a child or interpret it as being a child, which I think kind of goes back to your point of 
like seeing these realistic Spider-Man with the gut is that mm-hmm. we've never seen Spider-Man in his 30s before, which I thought was yeah. kind of interesting to see him in the mentor position versus um, like in Avengers where he's being mentored too. Um, mm-hmm. I thought that was a real interesting thing to see. I, I so love that you brought that up because I one of our my notes was the mentor-mentee relationship that he has, Peter P. Parker has with Miles and even Peter's... Um, enthusiasm for the role him being like you know i'm so used to, he's like everyone else i work with is trying to kill me this oh yeah is right such a nice change of pace <laughs> this is like, lovely <laughs> we gotta go with this absolutely well, yeah i got, on a second viewing i really picked up on the fact that when peter a parker as we're gonna call him was dying he's like oh yeah don't worry like i'll show you the ropes we'll make yeah. it all work and then the fact that he really the miles gets saddled with this other version what a disappointment yeah that would be, yeah. but it also it forces Miles to like have to be his own hero because yeah. you know the one he looks up to isn't really going to do it for him. Which is funny because you were like, uh, this this Peter has everything going for him, and it was like, and he dies. So like, and he dies. <laughs> yeah, if you have everything he dies, going, like, almost immediately. Well, <laughs> and Cameron, you had a really interesting point about how all the different Spider people in this kind of represent a different aspect of Spider Man. Uh, yeah, it's it's. I think I I don't know if they intentionally did it this way, but. Um, Outside of the main three, outside of uh, Peter B., Miles, and Gwen, uh, Penny Parker, uh, Spider-Noir, and Spider-Ham. Spider-Ham all kind of encompass the three aspects that make Spider-Man. You have the detective in Noir, you have the tech of Peter Parker and Penny Parker, and you have the, the witty, comedic side of Spider-Man and Spider-Ham. And Spider-Gwen. Yeah, and then Spider-Gwen... If if we include her, I see her as is the uh, the uh, like the poise and precision of swinging in the city. Of like that's such a big component of Spider Man. Absolutely, that she's perfectly encompasses. And that's actually when we first see her as uh, Spider Gwen or Spider Woman is like when they're he's teaching Miles how yeah. to like uh, split swing. Really yeah. split <laughs> really is. and and then like they fail. Like, they, yeah. like, like, you know? Well, because when. You, Cameron, you had mentioned that theory to me before. So when I went to go watch it a second time, I noticed that when they're down in the the spider cave, the amazing spider cave they have down there, when they're each asking, "Can you do these things?" It's like Spider-Man Noir is like, "Oh, can you fight?" Yeah. Which like that's the kind of thing he represents. And then Penny's like, "Oh, can you like do get tech. shot at and yeah. like reprogram a computer?" And Spider Gwen, it's easier to recognize her that way. She's like, "Oh, well, can you like do a triple?" Lutz, I think, is on ice. I don't know how these things work. I'm not a gymnast. I'm not an athlete at all. (laughs) Are you not? I'm a reader. (laughs) Nick Cage has a great line there where he goes, uh, can you close yourself off to the moral ambiguity of your violent actions or something like that? (laughs) I was still in Siege. I was like, you know what? Upon second viewing, I think Nick Cage has funnier lines than John Mulaney. I think John Mulaney's delivery is much funnier, but Nick Cage has great one-liners throughout mm-hmm. the film. And we talked about this, and I think that's because I said, comedy is like the divergence from expectations. So Spider-Ham, like the concept in itself is funny, and every, like the little bits of like this animated Looney Tunes type thing in this world is hilarious, and they constantly play on that. But... Um, Noir Spider Man is funny because what he says, he's so like he's so different in general. And as you said, his like his world is gritty and full of crime. So like when later on he's just fascinated with a Rubik's cube and he's like, This is purple, right? Yeah. And they're like, No, you're way off. <laughs> well, so that I think that plays a lot into the into the age range of the film. So I on my third viewing, I went to see it with my stepdad and my nephew, uh-huh. which are the opposite of the spectrum. My stepdad hates everything he sees, but he <laughs> loved this movie, and he didn't stop talking about it the entire time uh, I was in I was in Denver with my family. Yeah, uh, which was such a it's so warm to me seeing yeah, him yeah. like care about something. But he's seventy, and my nephew is seven, so it's literally the literally, whole yeah. spectrum. And and it's that it's that exact point. It's we can connect to. Peter B. Parker and and Spider Noir, but then when Spider Ham comes on, my nephew was just cracking up the yeah. whole time because like he got those jokes. Yeah, it's it's the Simpsons layering where you have the kid joke layered into the adult joke so Absolutely. everyone can enjoy it. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, can we talk a little bit about Miles Morales? Yes, Who? let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one thing on that note, uh, one of the reasons why. We, TC and I were like adamant about doing this episode with you is this is one of the blackest movies it, ever. It, it is so beautifully black. For people who they can't see us through the screen, Chris and I uh, seem to be white <laughs> because we are white. I, I'm wearing a Henley. Um, <laughs> yes, so I'm very, our podcast very, very, is very white. 
on the fact that we're black guys watching a very white show. So, like, that's inherent, but... <laughs> I will also say that I have a black father and a Spanish mother. I, oh, nice. So, okay. And to, to really see, like... and. Over Christmas, uh, you know, I have a family Facebook page and people are always posting pictures of what their kids are doing, whatever. And, um, you know, I have a really multicultural family and they all took their kids to go see this movie over the holidays. Aww. And like my nephews look like Miles. Yeah. And like for them, I was just so happy that they had something to identify with. You know, uh, we say on our podcast all the time, you can't be what you can't see. And it was really great for these kids to be able to have like something where they're like, oh, I can be this for Halloween and I don't need to explain what I am or I don't need to be the black version of Superman. I can just be Miles. And that, that was just a really cool moment. Yeah, there was there was a really awesome interview. I don't know if you guys uh, watch this one in your research where they're interviewing Miller uh, and he's talking about getting the the language precise between his mother and him, oh. where she is a first generation. Or sorry. Yeah, she yeah she's a first generation Spanish speaker and he's second generation. So the way they communicate, she has a very authentic accent, where his is very an, an Americanized accent, where he slips into English a lot more than she does. Yeah, and she speaks Spanish pretty much the entire film. Yeah, for the most part, she mm-hmm. does, and um, with no subtitles. So I thought it was such a great. I know. And they, they even like I talked love about that. Yeah, um, and what's it's again talking about this being a very black movie uh, a lot of the things are even subtle cues like there's uh, TC and I talked about this there's this uh, reaction it's a facial reaction um, and like when you're black a lot of your communication skills are in fact like through your face and all, it's nonverbal cues and there's a facial reaction when um, Peter B. Parker is like trying to negotiate or telling uh, Miles that he can't do something and Miles is just like looks away and he like it's something I was like it's so authentically black it's like just such a thing that you know a person of color had to be in the room in order to even express that that's what you would do <laughs> uh, and I was just gonna say too that he was the most realistic kid yes period but realistic kid of color that I have seen even in live action films in a very, very long time, his demeanor, the way he talked, his look, he looked like an actual kid. He didn't look like, you know, if they were doing a live action version of this with like Jaden Smith as Spider-Man, like it just, it wouldn't <laughs> oh, have boy. had that universal appeal. I think that this one had. Yeah. Cause he is very authentically a kid. Like he, he has that perfect level of awkwardness. Like he's trying so hard to be cool, but it's not working. So he just, just feels really kind of awkward and we, we were talking movie recently about the movie eighth grade oh yeah like the the shoulder touch right they try so hard to be cool yeah. and messing up and just like even his kind of inner monologue and especially the opening when it's that's paired with like the the text on screen all the thoughts that he was like why why am i saying this so loud right yeah. now it's yeah. like that weird sort of inner monologue that you know you especially had at that age it felt exactly very very authentic i actually i'm glad you brought up eighth grade because i actually thought about that when that scene where he's like he just had pulled out gwen's hair and he's walking through the hallway and he's like everyone knows and i actually thought about that scene in eighth grade where she's walking out to the pool party oh it yeah had a, had a very similar just like everyone's thinking about this which is such a middle schooler like everyone's thinking about me and what i've done kind of concept exactly well so a little um thing that i think is really important again and it's very much an adult joke but spider-man is very often uh, a story about puberty it's about you know your body changing in a radical way and you're thrust with all this responsibility but kind of like an adult joke hidden in that is when he gets his hand stuck in gwen's hair uh harry palms he has this Harry oh my god i didn't that he just even... looks down on right after his first interaction wow with Gwen. and it's like it's a little it's a small adult joke that again you have to like know what harry palms means oh, that's like right there my god did not even yeah, think about exactly. i didn't even think about the fact they snuck in a fantastic subtle masturbation joke right Absolutely. there and that just makes me that much but happier. again Holy right shit. after that is when he has this oh everyone knows he has like this guilt trip and he's like running through everyone knows what i've done everyone can see it why am yeah. i sweating and, and no one everyone knows that you are looking weird because you're reacting to something yeah. that no one else can see yeah because you're externally reacting to your own inner monologue and everyone's looking at you like what is this kid yeah. doing <laughs> what is going on here exactly. no i think he's like just one of the best characters we had in film this year he's so fantastic he's so interesting one yes. of the things i really identified with him too that i'm sure a lot of other people did was just that like in his free time he's just listening to music and drawing on his notepad and i was just like that's what i did when i was in 
second, eighth grade or whatever it was. I was listening to music. I was drawing. I just felt it was such like they were they gave him hobbies. They gave him things that like yeah. kind of layered him mm-hmm. and kind of made him more of a character um, than I would say the Peter Parker that I've seen in Sam Raimi's or some of the other ones. Just by giving him these things outside of being a student. Um that kind of he had to well, relate yeah. to the audience. I think it's with. really funny because, like, when uh, Peter B. Parker tells him to relax, he's like, "Dude, you gotta relax. What do you do to relax? Uh, Any yes. other movie, you would have seen like something else or like like a, a breathing. Deep breath. Yeah, but he's just like, and it's it's like this comedic moment. But as you said, it's like that's what I do to relax. Yeah, the film it it does a really good job of straying away from the tropes. Yes, and one of my favorite things that this movie does. Uh, in comparison to to other films and TV that have tried to do it, is they don't expect the audience to be dumb. They they expect the audience to have some level of knowledge to the point where their explanation of the multiverse was in the fucking background of another scene happening. Yeah, that's they a very explain good point. the multiverse while he's talking to Gwen uh, for the first time, and like, yeah, we don't need to understand it. We're gonna get it through vi- like visually. We're gonna understand what's happening. You don't have to stop the movie, pull out a chalkboard and be like, okay, so we're in this, we're this line. And then that, that Spider-Man, he's at this line and that yeah. Spider-Man, he's this line. So all these lines came, we, we twisted and now we got to untwist. Like, no, we, we understand that. Well, not only that, but like, in my opinion, I think one of the problems with a uh, franchise that's constantly rebooted is when they try to, te- especially like when it's been rebooted like four times in like the last this millennium. Years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like when they try to do it and they give you like the entry or the 101 that takes up half the movie and you're like, we know this. So like when uh, I think it's Justice League or I don't know, one of the worst Batmans. Yep. Uh, when they're like, they do the whole um, Batman movie parents dying Oh, scene. that like, would be uh, Batman this. v Superman colon Dawn of Justice <laughs> exactly. when Thomas and Martha Wayne yet again get their faces shot. Like, exactly. She literally got her face shot. It was, yeah, like, we're like, what is happening? We know this. So this movie does it differently because I remembered very... Poignantly being like, oh, we're skipping over the whole Uncle Ben scene. I don't need that. I know this. That was my main complaint with Amazing Spider-Man. The first one that came out was that I was like, oh, I had seen the first half of this movie in a way more interesting way 10 years ago. Yes. Yeah. With wrestlers. Yeah. (laughs) Which always makes it more interesting. But in the past year and a half, we've definitely had, like, people get Spider-Man. Yeah. And so when... um, Homecoming came out. We didn't get an origin story, which is great. When this movie came out, we didn't get an origin story. Which we we kind of had an origin story. They kind of parodied the origin story. Yeah, you know everyone, this. Let's do this one more time. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's like you know, I lost, I lost my uncle, I lost my uncle, I lost my best friend, and you just lost your uncle, and that's that's how it's going to happen. So that's what actually, and I, I want to talk about the uncle because that for me was a moment where I was like. Damn it, they still did it. They still gave us Mm -hmm. the death of the uncle, and I was not expecting that. And you did it in a way where it's like it shocked me and it made me care about something I've seen a million times. Well, and I think it's a reflection of how just Miles in general, and I haven't read those comics, although I really want to. I saw I read Ultimate Spider Man way back in the day when it first started, and I didn't follow through to the point where it switched over. But what I liked about the fact is he also has an uncle die, but it also feels like a much more modern story because the character is much more multidimensional it's like uncle ben was always like the best person ever and like uncle aaron and this is super flawed like he's a fantastic uncle but then like there's that fractured relationship with the dad too which i think is really interesting and so the idea is like yeah your uncle also dies but he also is a villain but we also spent time with him he's a good guy we like him and to give it that much texture and depth made it way more interesting like because we got the uncle ben moment and like I, i think it was still the cliff robertson Sam Raimi, like, audio when we, like, yeah. Peter A. Parker touches on it. But I thought that was a much more emotionally impactful, interesting way to handle that story. I actually took that same note at that Uncle Aaron dies at, like, the hour mark of the movie or something mm-hmm. like that. It's not something that happens in the beginning. Like, you get him re- uh, hanging out with Miles. You understand his relationship with uh, Miles' father. Um, and then you also have this really hyper-emotional action scene that happens right at his death where there's all these revelations and all these like crazy family conflicts coming uh into light right as he dies so it kind of gives it that much more meaning um when you see miles's dad find his dead estranged brother 
with Miles at the foot of his body, and you're just like, what does this mean? Like, that is yeah. such an interesting scene. It's a fucking Greek tragedy. Over yeah. There. Well, 100%. I think that uh, a thing that's great about this is we all talked about, like, the truth in um, Miles' youth in this movie. Mm -hmm. I noticed that they let him be a kid. They let him be overwhelmed by the things that are happening yeah. to him. Very often, again, you just have to step up. You have to be the hero or have to deal with things, but... I mean, let's take the first interaction with uh, Spider-Man that he happens. He's like, I should go help. No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> uh, no, I'm just going to shrink back here. And yeah, I liked that his whole arc, you know, it was a leap of faith. At the end of the day, it was believing in yourself, which I think it's it's just amazing. And the that payoff moment when he finally, like, puts on the suit and he's wait on the building when he jumps off and just the music in that scene too is incredible. We, we have incredible. to talk about the music of this movie. It's so, it's so, so the so music good. of this movie is again, it's, it just ties back into what I was saying. It was just like, it's such a black movie and it's so beautifully <laughs> black, but also we talked about like, they use music so perfectly. Like there's like, um, I can't, is it like a piano or whatever? There's like this. Dong, oh, like, oh whenever, whenever the, the prowler, prowler. Yeah, yeah, the yes, prowler. whatever that sound, is it's whatever it so, is it it's, becomes like a like a leap motif of the movie too like it pops up in places even when he's not in the suit it's like oh that's my what i'm saying and then, so what's crazy is like there's like all this tension when he's in his uncle's apartment mm -hmm. um and they're constantly just hitting on that note and you're like you're tense because you're like the prowlers in the room he's gonna see him and then when the uncle removes his mask and they also do that again and you're like oh it's they've constantly been telling us yeah but it's and just miles like, is reacting action is for an animated film i was like I, that was like seeing simba see his dad like i was like <laughs> yeah. oh my, i feel everything you're feeling right now yeah the, absolutely it just there's a lot of emotional gut punches in this movie like yeah, that definitely. moment um for me one when aaron dies but especially when the dad sees it when I mean, like his dad sees his brother on the ground and like you can tell how fractured their relationship is like what five minutes before that he's on the phone it's like you know i wouldn't call unless it was important yeah just right, that little right. note sets up how estranged they are and the the way he reacts is it's really, really sad. And then kind of on the opposite end of that, the his final, Miles' final speech about anyone can be a hero. It's just like, I'm like looking around I'm like, is anyone else? No, no. <laughs> is I else cried. cheering we up cried, in yeah. this movie? <laughs> I cried because, um, for me, I cried because there were several scenes. I think you talked about the one where it's like when they're in the spider cave and Miles looks up uh, and his reflections on the suit. Mm, yeah, yeah, And they do it in a way that what's interesting is like they don't impose his face over the suit like they usually would do, but he's still like he's seeing that he can be. And then the at the end when he's like, what I took away from it, and I was like, they're literally telling you this. This is a superhero movie that's saying you're not limited by the I don't know expectations of. Superman is white and Batman is white, you know, all this other stuff. Like, like every any, other character. Yeah, like every other character. It's like a, a woman can be, a Gwen, you know, it's like females can be, Asians can be, like anyone can be, pigs, pigs, pigs can yes, be, yes. anyone can be Spider Man. And it literally made my heart swell because it's like a, as TC said, to actually see that on film, to actually see something say, no, literally, even you can have a part of this lore made me feel special and it yeah can, it can i just rewind real fast that moment where he looks up and he sees the reflection of his face on the spider-man costume i couldn't help but notice that the animation made him look a lot like donald glover and i don't know if that was intentional oh, or not interesting. but in the reflection i was like his face looks just like donald in that in that that quick moment which well, is do, a throwback for to donald for spider-man for yeah. Spider when we first a little bit of trivia when we first meet uh uncle aaron community is playing and it's the episode. Is where, it yeah. really? It's the episode what? where Donald oh my God. wears the spider T-shirt. I did not realize that. I did not recognize that. I mean, it goes to show how many really fun little Easter eggs are oh, thrown absolutely. in there. But my personal favorite is when Gwen lands in Times Square. In the background, there's a poster for uh, Clone College. Yes, because cl I loved Clone High in high school. Yeah. Like that was like that was my friend's side. That was our show. Like I will still throw out Clone High references. No one gets them, but I'm gonna stand behind them so i keep bringing this up but it's really important Times square is such an important uh location in this movie mm -hmm. because what it shows you is in this multiverse or in this version of the universe um 
black is the norm. Or like Yeah, like, I, I we both got the vibe that racism in this one was not as big of a deal. Even in his prep school, there was so much diversity in there. Well, I don't know if you what's noticed. interesting is it's called Planet Inglewood. That was like um what I noticed. Oh, I didn't even it's catch Planet that. Planet Inglewood is the Planet Hollywood alternative. The Planet yeah. Hollywood alternative in this one. So that is what made me start looking at things. And then when instead of when Peter B. Parker's, it's Coca Cola. Mm-hmm. In this, it's cola or Coca Soda or something like that. But it changes from a a white uh, model mm-hmm. to a black model in this universe. And there are like all these subtle clues in the background that oh, show shit. you that um, diversity is way more of a norm mm-hmm. uh, in this universe. And again, it was like it was a beautiful thing to see because it's like what what would that world look like? Yeah. Yeah. But but then on the other side, the two main bill board advertisements were the whitest yeah, yeah. of the yeah. actors and characters. It was the Seth Rogen ad, and oh, then it was yeah. Hi Hello, which is John Mulaney's, the parody of John Mulaney's Broadway show. Uh, oh, hello, we said hello. diversity. You can't, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the other thing. You got you to counteract yeah, 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 with the yeah, whitest yeah. you can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I spotted a few other things in that Times Square scene. Um, the Hi Hello, uh, also uh, From Dusk Till Shaun, a yeah. Shaun of the Dead <laughs> remake, I guess, well, that or was, reboot. Well, no, that was actually supposed to be the sequel to Shaun of the Dead. Oh, so it actually came out in this universe. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, Peekaboo as a Snapchat replacement was mm-hmm. one of them. And um, <laughs> Baby Shower with the cast of Bridesmaids. Yeah, I did see that. I did see oh, yeah. that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all really fun. As you said, really fun Easter eggs mm-hmm. um, that he showed. But I think for me, it goes back to what this movie was trying to do, which is always uh, challenge your expectations, which I think is a- another great point of that is Doc Ock. Because yes. what they do... What I said to TC when I first watched it is this movie does not judge you for your expectations. Mm -hmm. It always says that we're going along this ride, too. So when he's looking from afar and he's like, no, the woman is the one in charge. And he goes, oh, challenge my expectations, you know. And then five seconds later, they reveal that she's Doc Ock immediately they're like oh we just did that so you don't feel as bad yeah because <laughs> we just pointed out that, that yeah that is one of the coolest reveals in the whole thing because absolutely because i i forgot until the second viewing that she is the the doctor or she's the scientist explaining the multiverse in the background which makes sense because that's literally what she's studying yeah and so it says dr olivia right but then yeah. her last name is cut off by miles when it's up in the front i also noticed this time that she has octagonal glasses oh wow which that was ah. very, very clever, very subtle. Ah. Um, but yeah, like even when she meets Spider Man, like when she meets Peter B. Parker, like, oh, like she's on board. She seems like the cool one. She's a reasonable, rational one. Oh, wait, no, she's fucking Doc Ock. And like that is a really cool way of doing the Doc Ock arms, too. Like, I don't know if it's air or water or what's yeah. going on inside yeah. the tubes, but it's completely different. Totally surprising. And and um, even like Aunt May, too, yeah. they, they do a cool twist in that where they show up at the house and we think she's going to be like overwhelmed by this. She's like, oh, no, there's a shitload more. And then it's also she designed all that gadget. She built she's the web like shooters. The Alfred of the Yeah, she's like the Alfred, even like the Q almost. Like she builds the stuff. Also trying to get back on Tinder, have a good time, which I thought was a, like a really oh, nice little yeah, that <laughs> was good trying too. to get her groove back. Exactly. <laughs> I'd watch that film. <laughs> uh yeah, MA's new groove. Yeah. <laughs> uh also voiced by David Spade. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um yeah, kind of, kind of going back to the to the Easter egg thing. I feel like film, animated film specifically, they're really embracing the fact that like they know fans and they yes. know fans are crazy and they care about this <laughs> shit. And we're just gonna we're gonna keep it in frame for we're gonna keep it on screen for three frames. Someone's gonna find it and they're gonna fucking love it. Absolutely. Because I, I bring it up with Teen Titans Go before because that was like another movie that blew me out of the water expectations wise where they hid things in that movie for single frames uh, that you can only see if you basically pause the movie. Uh, One of my favorite ones is in the background when they're walking through the movie. Have you guys seen Teen Titans go to the movies? I haven't seen it. I have not. I want to. I really, if you're, if you're any level of DC fan, I highly recommend it. Cause like you don't have to watch the animated show to get it. Um, But one of my favorite inside jokes they have is they're walking through a movie theater and there's a poster for a Superman film in the background. And every time they cut away, they add or remove a mustache. <laughs> uh, and it, it'll only be there for like a second. Like yeah. you, like if you don't look that, you won't even notice it. And then when it cuts back, it won't be there. And that's one of the funniest things that only like only fans will get that joke. 
So what's interesting for me is that I felt that way about Brooklyn in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, having lived in Brooklyn, uh, has anyone else lived in New York? Or Nope. I will say that. So one of the things uh, my best friend Numit and I, we were watching it together when TC and I watched it. And he was like, dude, do you notice they have green cabs? And there is green cabs are specific to Brooklyn. Really? Yellow cabs are Manhattan. Green cabs are Brooklyn. Oh, that's awesome. And it was like the detail that they have in this. Like, I remember like trying to look for locations and then remembering that it's an animated movie. But like, it's they do it so well that in this city, everything is so realistic. Um, and, and Miles is also mad proud to be from Brooklyn. Like he's oh, constantly yeah. throwing out Brooklyn. Like when when Uncle Aaron takes him to that spot for the first time, he's like Brooklyn. Yeah, absolutely. Bound, like throwing Biggie up in the background. Like yeah, it's but just, I'm just saying, yeah. like Brooklyn. Brooklyn does have like its own identity, and it, like it actually makes sense for like the Miles character. But to see New York done in that way, there's so many times where like New York is done, and you ask yourself like who like who goes from here to there? <laughs> like you know, there's, there's no res- real respect given to the location, and in this movie, you could tell that whoever did this absolutely understood and loved Brooklyn. Well, it, it's a it's a thing that Chris and I bring up constantly with film. In that you don't have to make it, a f- I mean, it, to be fair, this is like a, a global destruction kind of thing, yeah. but it, you don't need your fucking giant blue light in the sky that's going to destroy <laughs> New York. It doesn't have to be that generic every time. You can tell these small stories and keep them in, uh, in, in a, what's the, what's the word when you're writing a TV script and you stay in one location? Oh, um, bottle up, bottle, episode, episode, bottle yeah. episode. You can keep it in a bottle, yeah. and it still works so well. I mean, Ant Man One did that very well, where there was no global threat. Yeah. Um, and then this. Is- well, I think the, you know, if you make uh, characters that the audience cares about, and you make damage to like a, a danger to those characters, then it'll be a good film. Like that's just just make yeah. Characters you you, that are you as the audience member still feel the same amount of threat and danger when it's when it's one character you care about as opposed to an entire city like i don't fucking care about cities blowing up i'm so desensitized to seeing things seeing cities blow up that like it, I don't. I don't feel it anymore. That desensitized they even hit on in the movie, which I love. It's when Peter B. Parker is like they're infiltrating um, the office, and he's just like, "It's always the end of the world." Now, look, I would guarantee you he's gonna be like, "You have twenty four hours. Twenty four hours. You have twenty four hours." <laughs> See, I told you. And it's just like it's like this hitting on the nose of, as you said, both being desensitized to like, "Oh, it's always the end of the world," but also we've all seen these superhero movies where like everything's always at stake. There's always a clock. And to that point, the way that this movie makes it not that is by making the central uh, hero and villain's main goal be family. So you have Miles saying, like, the first thing Spider-Man says to Miles is, hey, you need to do this, otherwise your family, everyone you care about is going to go away. Now, on the other side of the coin, you have Kingpin, who he's doing all of this to try to bring his family back. So even the villain is sympathetic. You're like, I can understand wanting to see your family again that you've lost. And Miles, I want to keep the family that I have. So it's like two sides of the same coin, but it makes it so that both characters have something that you can relate to. And you're like, I would fight for that as well, possibly. Here's an alternate ending that I would have really loved to see of the movie. Where Fisk does get all of all of the all of the other versions of his wife and son back, and then the post credit scene is them all bickering of like who's the wife, <laughs> like, and they're all just they're all just like being like super backstabby and fake happy to each other. Do you like to see like a what is it? I'm thinking of like a Three's Company type thing. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking more like like uh, Desperate Housewives. Uh, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> and it also kind of has that like Aladdin Jafar like be careful what you wish for kind of thing. Like this could end up being really bad. It, mm-hmm. Well, I think when I watched it this time, and I don't know if like maybe it were tricks being played on my eyes, but I think there are different versions of that family like i think oh, yeah, I there like are. Yeah, yeah. a blonde version and it's yeah. like oh wow it's really, they really are they never lose sight that this is a multi-dimensional grab so it's like you're not getting this um mother and daughter from another one that he's trying to pull forward and that's what's no it's like you're trying to pull multiples yeah it's not the same it's not his exact same wife and child he's getting back it's another version of them and, I and on that point i am very sad we did not get 
a pig version. <laughs> yes. Um, although technically it wouldn't be a pig. It would be a spider version because yeah, spider yeah. ham was a spider bitten by a radioactive pig. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, a very so important point that needs to be brought up. To this point, and I was really hoping that you guys would be able to help me out with this because I know Spider-Man in the sense that I've seen the Sam Raimi films. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw Avengers. Like I've seen the, that stuff, a little bit of the animated series from the 90s. But there was a lot of questions I had as far as like, um, this spider that bites Miles, is this the same spider that bites Peter A. Parker? Is this a different spider? How, what is this? A different one. It's like think, a... Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's a different one. I, I listened to uh, an interview with Lord and Miller, um, the Empire podcast. They do like their spoiler specials and always bring in creatives. They interview them. And they were saying that that is a different one. And I think that actually think came from a different universe too. Oh, did it? Because what I noticed the second time around is that when we first see the spider, it glitches. So That's it doesn't right. belong there oh, wow. either. So now I think Peter, Peter A. Parker, as we'll call him, I think he was bit by an Alchemex spider. I think they all were. But I think that one came from somewhere else, which also explains why Miles has different powers yes. ah. than in the other Spider-Men we see. Because like whatever version, whatever universe that one came from has like the invisibility and has the, I guess, like the venom the touch, the venom shock yeah, or whatever. Like, what, what was interesting about uh, that scene, which again, talking about suppressing expectations, is it's always a big moment when oh, Spider-Man yeah, yeah. is bit. And for him, it's it just, like he's bit and like there's like this huge thing and Miles just like, <laughs> like he just like it up. taps it and he like walk, goes about his life you know it's like yeah. what was usually like this moment and it's like he's changed and it was just like oh yeah, yeah whatever <laughs> you, you know what I call on my second viewing is that Uncle Aaron probably knew of that place because of what was going no, no, on absolutely. Yeah. Right? He, says, yeah. Yeah. he says I did a job here. Yeah, I did an engineering job, job. yeah here. exactly I, so again talking about it it's beautiful because we also see for me it's always interesting to sh- um see certain things certain certain representation uncle aaron is a genius like i'm not gonna lie you kind of write him off as someone who's probably like a drug dealer or something like that mm-hmm. when you first see him because like he has his cell phone he's like i gotta go and it's like all these things but when you really find out what he's doing he's uh an en- engineering or a technical genius yeah he has like this other uh part of him that you just didn't give credit to and i think again setting you up for certain expectations and then changing them. what are his abilities the prowler that was another question i had. I, I don't know i i don't really know much that much about that character so i i knew going in that miles's uncle was a villain. I knew that I was waiting for that reveal. I don't know if you guys knew that. Going I did in. not know that. Okay, so, so it was like, it was it was like, like a genuine twist. Rise. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if he actually has powers. I, I think he, to CJ's point, he just built that suit. I think that's him just building So like it. an Iron Man type of... Yeah, so I think yeah. it just, it has probably some sort of energy source and I think like it allows him to like leap and the boots can do something. But yeah, I think it's it's all mechanical. I don't think he has any now, inherent abilities. Now this Kingpin no supernatural abilities no. but at one no. point he catches a car so he, super I, strength <laughs> I, i'm i'm chalking that up to um them being at the like the focus point of the dimension hopping and like i think at that point kind of gravity and physics are a little bit skewed okay, okay. That, that's what i'm going to chalk that up to i, I, I mean think, yeah, i think like he is a super train strong runs into them and they're just like yeah, so yeah. Like, also <laughs> he kills peter a parker with just like a fist punch so that's why I was kind of wondering if he had super strength at all. I I I don't think it's no. No, they never he he's kind of like the Lex Luthor effect where he's he's just a guy who's very very strong. Uh where he's, he's the Suge Knight of Yes, he, <laughs> no, he, he exactly joke, is. Yes. But he's actually supposed to be the Suge Knight. So <laughs> yeah. kind of Have you guys sense. have you guys played the Spider-Man game yet? No. The PS4 game? That's another one that I wanted to bring up where they just completely jump over the origin story. You you're you jump in that game where you've been Spider-Man for years, where like it's already you're you're kind of the spe- the Peter B. Parker Spider-Man, where you're at the stage where it's like ruining your relationship with Mary Jane. Uh, <laughs> serious <laughs> stuff to like, throw in the game. Is it, yeah. is, it, is it ice or is it bread? I think it's bread. Where it's just like that little yeah, scene yeah. where he's just like, I should have always tried to give you bread. Yeah, but, <laughs> she's like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, um, but, uh, but yeah, in the in the game. Wait, for, I forgot I was going with this. What were we talking about a second ago? No super strength. No super Yeah, so Kingpin, yeah, they, they usually portray him as just kind of this this kind of hulking figure. Yeah, exa- yeah, just the Suge Knight. This hulking figure that is is just kind of a... Connected. Uh, mm-hmm. Did you see uh, uh, the Ben Affleck Daredevil? Yes, yes, I did. So that, that's kind of the same way. Okay. Um, well, he was played by the, the late Michael great... Michael Clark Duncan. Yeah. Um, 
where yeah he he can go toe to toe with these amazing people because he's just, just based on brute strength yeah he's just like peak human strength okay mm -hmm. now i had a question for you guys as well the bullet that kills uncle aaron mm -hmm. was it meant for miles or was it meant to punish a disobedient aaron the latter i think yeah he was, was he latter. was aiming for aaron yeah He's here to send a message. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> but no, that's what I loved about it. Like, um, I think what makes... Shot on the strip. Uh, ...him, Kingpin, such a good villain is that he has this very business-like, no-nonsense. Like, you know, it's like a... No, when I say 24 hours, I like... And other people say that, I mean it. And it's like a... Kill this dude. Oh, you won't? Well, then I'll get rid of you, and then we'll still, we're still we still going to move on. Um, even in Daredevil, his ruthlessness is what makes him a true villain. It's not like his like ultimate goal or anything like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. I also just love how many Spider-Man villains they crammed in here. Cause six. You get, exactly six. That's right. It is. Yeah, it's six. It's, They're sinister six. Yeah, because oh. it's, uh, it's Green Goblin. So Norman Osborn's Green Goblin, and then Kingpin, Doc Ock, Scorpion, Tombstone, Prowler. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, like, there you go. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> That's so good. I mean, I, again, to your point, Cameron, about how this it takes its audience seriously. That like you don't need to explain everything. We just just know all these people exist. You get the basic concept of all of it, and just go and have fun it with it. It kind of takes the same approach that the Batman Lego Movie yeah did of just kind of like we all know this so we're just going to make a joke of it yeah um but through those jokes they're almost like they're giving you um i i like like clever exposition i think through yeah. the jokes mm -hmm. absolutely well i also i just think about um infinity war and how same thing infinity war was like whether you know the history or not a this stuff has been out there you had a chance <laughs> so if you yeah. came you here, had your turn yeah if you came here to watch this movie we're assuming it's because you have some knowledge and even if you don't have direct knowledge of what's going on you're smart enough to yeah. to get well the in infinity war i i just kind of realized this a few days ago they introduced the characters in order of like mo not really most popular, but like ones that people would recognize first. Okay, nice. Um, yes, yeah, so like everyone knows Iron Man in that film. Everyone like through Iron Man, they kind of know Doctor Strange because Benedict Cumberbatch was is very big. Uh, and then we see uh, Thor is next, and then uh, Hulk is next. And like, okay, fans, even if you don't know the movies, you know these people just because you've lived on Earth. And Ant Man and Hawkeye just are nowhere around. Because exactly. Yeah. No the, the, I think the last ones they introduce are like Vision and I guess Cap, but that that's because it was supposed to be a secret. Yeah. Uh, is Cap is a uh, Vision and Scarlet Witch because they're the ones that people don't like. Unless you know the movies, you don't really know these people. Absolutely. I would argue, and obviously Infinity War has a much bigger cast, but I would argue that Spider Verse does a much better job of juggling multiple characters that you kind of care about. I went walked into an Infinity War not having seen some Marvel movies, but I was just like, Blasphemous. I don't care about this character. If I was just watching this movie, I wouldn't care about um, Chris Pratt's character. I wouldn't care about some of these other characters just based on this if I had seen it blind. Whereas with Spider-Man and Spider-Verse, I was able to attach myself to some of these characters like, you know, Spider-Ham without having been given a ton of screen time. Well, I think it's interesting because even if we go to um, Kingpin, his story, like his motivation, as I, one of you had pointed out earlier, it's so concise. It's like I think it takes less than thirty seconds for them yeah. to give you everything you if, need. If you if you <laughs> if you like zone out for a minute, you miss his backstory. Absolutely, and that 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 really says a lot because it's it's it again it's it's almost punishing viewers for not paying attention. <laughs> Which I like. I think we're moving towards that just in television and movies. I think, honestly, uh, I was just talking to someone about Bandersnatch, uh, the new Netflix mm -hmm. movie. Because it it's a new way of Netflix to be like, we're not in the background anymore. You need to, you need to pay attention or else you will miss out on the whole purpose of this experience. Um, and I think that that's kind of like where we're getting at. It's just like... We consume so many things, and there's so much media out there. The bubble is so big now yeah. that you're on board or you're not. Yeah, so and also pick a side. <laughs> and also, just for filmmakers to understand that people traditionally will YouTube and Google what they're about to see before they go see it. So, like the education is there if you want it. There's no reason to explain all of this, but Spider Verse 
I have to say, does explain it in a very concise, clear way that makes you care about the characters. Mm-hmm. I, I do want to talk a, 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 for a brief second about the the side three spiders because we, we haven't really given a lot of a lot of talk to Ham, Noir, and Penny. Uh, one of the things that I love from an animation standpoint is all three of them were animated completely differently from yes. the rest of the cast, and I thought that was so awesome and fascinating to see. Where Noir. Uh, Everything, because everything was in black and white, uh, but he always had, uh, they make a joke about it where the, where, you know, I go where the wind, wherever I go, the wind follows, <laughs> but that is literally there. Every time you see him, you might not notice it, but his, his trench coat is always flowing. Penny Parker, they animate in a much more anime style, which I always love to see. I'm a huge anime nerd for anyone that listens to our podcast, uh, knows, and, and spider ham is very, very traditional animation based on, uh, fucking tex avery uh the, the the king the 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 crowned king of like animation slapstick comedy uh like all of hanna barbera learned from uh, all of hanna and looney tunes learn from tex avery and it's just you, you see it in the trailer there's the one moment where spider ham kind of comes in to shake his hand and he does this little dip and it's it's something that like animation nerds fucking go crazy over where you, it's it's the full body follow through that you don't see outside of Looney Tunes. And that like it made me go crazy when I saw it in trailers and in the, in in theaters. It oh, I love it. Well, like <laughs> Spider-Ham even makes a joke about it and he's like, "What? You have a problem with cartoons?" And it's, it's like kind of pointing at the <laughs> yeah. audience a little bit. It's like, "Oh, you didn't think this would like have the same sort of impact or be as like it fantastic as like Infinity War?" Like, "No, like we, I think the reason this movie works is that it embraces everything, right? So it embraces the fact that it's animation, it embraces its blackness. It's just like, why beat around the bush? We know what we're going to do. We know what we are. It's a full-on superhero movie. Make it about superheroes. Let's put them in the, the big, bright, crazy costumes. I Oh, I was just going to say, um, I did listen to your guys' podcast you did on Mary Poppins oh, recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, the, what you guys talked about, of seeing 2D animation on screen and that feeling of just like, wow, it was so mm-hmm. good to see this again. That's how I felt with Spider-Ham too. And with Mary Poppins as well. But with Spider-Ham, I was just like, there. I was sad that this was lost from culture for a while. Yeah. This type of humor, this type of entertainment, that this isn't readily available. And it's nice to see it getting some kind of spotlight. Well, And it was so smart about how it addressed it. Right? It brought in the tropes. Like he drops an anvil on someone's head. And the best part <laughs> is that it comes out of nowhere. Like, where'd this anvil come from? And then he just like kind of waddles on the screen. Like, oh, right. We have a full on like Looney Tunes character here. And then the mallet. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah. The, well, the mallet. And then also. It yeah, always yeah. in your pocket. It's... When when Spider Ham leaves, one of the last like things that happens is the anvil still there, and it's mm-hmm. again, it's this acknowledgement of no, we brought this into the universe, and it doesn't just disappear; it's here yeah. now. Um, and as you said, taking ownership of the decisions you've made, and I just I loved that anvil. Um, it's so stupid. I grew up watching Tex Avery. They're, they're amazing. They're and so, good. so anytime someone brings in an anvil and they use it wisely, I just I'm I'm blown away. Yeah, they found a fresh way to do those like really well trod jokes so something you brought up uh that i wanted to bring up was uh or bring back was the costume and mm-hmm. the fact that miles spends the majority of the movie yes. in, in this purchased costume um that, that we have to talk about the moment he gets the costume oh, but uh, like uh, yeah. also just the idea that he spends most of the time and they even make fun of him i think i forgot who does it he's like what kind of superhero wears his own merch or oh, like yeah. something like that yeah <laughs> what i actually had a question about that because mm-hmm. um when he goes to put on the costume the same thing that happens when he goes to put on his pants after he gets bitten he's taller um yeah. oh, that wasn't i just i guess i wanted to understand why he got taller from a spider bite i'm not sure why he got taller maybe it, like it did accelerate um like puberty a little bit i mean because you know, like in the the raimi film like all of a sudden toby mcguire wakes up and he's like yoked as fuck and like he can see you without his glasses and stuff. Like, I guess the idea is like it just makes you like a, a slightly, prime specimen. yeah, like a, a better version of yourself, like a more okay. yeah, a prime specimen version. So I think that's what happened there. It just, like accelerated his his aging. <laughs> no, no, I'm just I keep laughing at that because I remember when Miles just kept being like, I'm, "It's just puberty." It's puberty. Like, I'm sorry, I don't know. What's... Like everyone's just like, "What's going on?" He's like, "No, it's just puberty." And so, it's... yeah, and then, and then Gwen, while he's all while he's yelling, he's like, "I don't think you know what puberty yeah, is." Yeah. You know what that means? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, about the costume, I also love that he was in Jordans for a majority of the movie. I just thought that was a really great touch. It's a fashion choice. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, everyone, well, I love that. That's another thing where. 
people are constantly telling him, hey, your shoes are untied. Yeah. And he's like, no, it's a choice. I'm doing this on purpose. But the first time we see him try to, like, run and do anything, he trips over his shoelaces. And then, like, again, it's like this universe acknowledges everything that it set up. I, I think didn't even – they made custom Spider-Verse Jordans, right? I would actually, I, I can't awesome. wait for Halloween next year to rock the Spider-Verse costume with the Jordans and the hoodie. I just yes. think it's such a cool look. I, mean, I think that's been one of the best things about what's been happening in terms of like huge uh, summer blockbusters and pop culture is, uh, we were talking about earlier, is now people who didn't have those heroes before have them. Like to, to this day, if I'm at Disneyland, I see little girls dressed up as like Ray or Captain Faz or something. It makes us so happy. And like now people have miles they have yeah. black panther and like they have wonder woman it's just like it's like thank god like, aquaman but, but aquaman even, yeah <laughs> but even i know some, those kids with <laughs> epic beards but yeah. i don't have a hero to dress exactly. up as they have someone I, to look up the, to the so, yeah. 13 year olds with the heavy beard yeah, yeah it's gonna look great <laughs> where was their costume no um it's actually what i thought was interesting is this movie alone gives you so many spider-man all of those like you you can have your entire family can go as a different spider-man and that oh. is 100% oh going to be the group God. costumes at Halloween. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna it's be, it's the, gonna be the Spider-Verse, guys. Comic-Con. Yeah, because I always, I always can tell like who, who's going to be big by what's the Comic-Con costume. Yeah. But because, that whole save it for Comic-Con joke that they yeah. have. In what's that Comic-Con? Movie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot what it was. But he goes save it for Comic-Con. And it's just mm-hmm. like, Here's how a, many Spider-Man oh, yeah, are how, there yeah, is what yeah, he yeah. says. Here's yeah. another question I have. And again, it's just very like mild understanding of Spider-Man's universe. The comics coexist with Peter Parker as Spider-Man the way they do with Miles to the point where like he was being Spider-Man but there was also comics of Spider-Man that existed in the same world so so that was actually very small a fun fun very small easter egg where there's another Spider-Man that you said the name of and I forgot it's like Todd something Ben Riley. Ben Riley. That's the Spider-Man in the comics in that movie. Oh, so yeah, okay. it's not when like because you see the origin story in the comic, and instead of it being Peter, it's Ben. Um, yeah. So in the, I, I only know a bit about this. I never read them, but I think it was like the late '80s, maybe. There was a whole thing called the Spider-Man Clone Saga, and basically this guy named Ben Riley shows up and he says, "Oh, I'm the original Spider-Man. You, Peter Parker, are actually clone of me." And so Peter Parker stops being Spider-Man for a while and Ben Riley takes it over. I mean, this is the same thing that was happening like with Batman at the same time. Like, oh, they sure. break his back and then all of a sudden now it's John Paul Valley as Ezreal comes four. in. What? There's four Batman. There's four Batman. Yeah, there's so well, many Batman. Yeah, when Superman died, we had a lot of Yeah, the, the, yeah, exactly. The four Superman come in. It's kind of the same concept. but basically, Which we would not have gotten Shaquille O'Neal steal from without... Are, are you are you guys I, not familiar with Steel? I, I know of it. I, I saw it as a kid. I saw it as a kid. I have not revisited it in a long time. I love. I, I believe it's only available on VHS. I'm sure it is, but that's the only way to watch it. It's the best way to watch it. I've always loved Steel, though. I, I, that's a fantastic character. But uh, but yeah. So in in Spider Verse, the comics, I, I guess it's someone made stories about Spider Man, but it's just not referred to as Peter sure. Parker. So sure. someone okay. just made those comics and called him Ben Riley instead. Um, so, so I, I know you guys have a heart out out of this. I want to, I want to try and wrap it up really quick and I want to ask a very open-ended question for the, for the last couple minutes. Um, what do you want to see come out of this movie now? It's like, we have this amazing movie. Everyone's loving it. It's making decent amount of money. Where do you want to see film culture go from here? I'll start. Um, I was actually really hoping that the final credit sequence would be uh, Miles crossing universes into the current MCU um, somehow, some way, and getting Miles like a live action interpretation, like ha- the popularity of him somehow merging in because you have uh, Donald Glover as Uncle Aaron in the MCU already. So I just thought that would have been an interesting twist. And obviously that's still a possibility. Um, but just seeing... Uh, you know, I feel like Miles in its conception got kind of like the backdoor treatment of like, let's just give it an animated film, but not understanding how great this character was. So maybe some kind of live action interpretation I would like to see. Um, if not that, I would love to see more unique ways to do animation going forward, separate from Spider-Man. Just the way this was done as an animated film was gorgeous. And I would love to see more of that. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say that um, what I would like to see 
is this embracing of um, diversity and, and understanding that diversity isn't just like a, a thing to get people in. It's not like 3D. <laughs> it's like, and we did it as a black cast. You know, it's like, what would that be like? Which, to be fair, I kind of feel is being done in some ways uh, with certain movies. They're like remaking it, but they're like, but what if a black woman was, and, you know, instead of... Doing Are you that. thinking of the remake of What Women Want exactly. called What Men Want? Exactly. Which I was thinking of the remake of Big called Little. <laughs> exactly. Right. Oh, yeah. I just watched the trailer <laughs> yeah, yeah. for that. Exactly. Which, don't get me wrong. I'm going to go see Little. Yeah. Sure. I love all the actors in the movie. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're all but hilarious. The difference is I would love this idea of like taking these characters who are maybe in this universe or maybe doing their own, but it's a different story and it's completely embracing. Yeah, we don't need oh, the whiz. We don't need just a black interpretation of the same yeah. story. We need just unique stories. And I feel like we got a very, especially amongst the brother and the dad, I mean, uh, Uncle Aaron and uh, Miles's father. I just felt like there was a lot of really unique storylines um, that were, I, I grabbed you that maybe wouldn't exist otherwise. Absolutely. So I think that's really good because it, it increases the representation as we talked about. Which then, amazing black role models in that movie with his absolutely. dad. Like a uh, fantastic mm -hmm. uh, Though that's what I talked about. Uncle Aaron has a, he's a smart guy. I mean, yeah. like he's not someone who we, uh, you know, he's, but it also at the end of the day, he chooses family overall, you know, yeah. like at the very end. It's, it's an but act of heroism that his father is his uh, a cop. Jefferson's a, a cop. And then his mother is a nurse. So it's like, these are people who have jobs that are contributing. You know what I mean? Jefferson gives a beautiful monologue to Miles when he's oh, tied up in the room. Oh my too. God. Yeah. Oh and that's like another emotional Again, gut punch yeah, scene. Just like a, such a moment. Um, but then also, as TC had said, Taking chances, mm -hmm. um, taking chance, like the animation in this, yeah, yeah, the animation in this. It, I just I cannot say enough. Uh, so so fun little fact about this. I don't know if you guys saw this in your research. Uh, they they went instead of going to a film studio, they went to a design team to get the look of this film. It took them a year to get ten seconds of this kind of animation done. Oh wow! Uh, so it, the film took a little over two years to make, and so half of that time was for ten seconds and just to just to get this specific look nailed but and they like nailed that it. yeah exactly like that shows if you put in the if you put in the time and effort and if you give the right people the creative freedom that they need you can come out with just the most unique a golden globe yeah you can come out with a, yeah. with a globe. you can beat disney yeah, yeah. and in the year where they have the second highest grossing animated film of all time Absolutely. Like you can you can knock that out of the park, and you and with like a month left, too. You know, it's like a, yeah, you just you slipped in there at the it. end, yeah. But like, oh, I'm so sorry. Even talking about that style, I think what is interesting is it's such a love note as we were talking about to comics, and it's such a love note yeah. to the material. And I think that's what we're seeing is movies that understand the value of whatever they're acknowledging so like the value of comic books the value yeah. of cartoons the value of these different stories i think it's really really important well, yeah even even right at the top before the movie even starts yeah. you get approved by the comics code that's what and i was the, gonna you, say the second you, yeah the second you get in you're like oh this is a comic book movie yeah absolutely this is great absolutely we're not gonna see arnold schwarzenegger as mr freeze like, <laughs> no yeah we're, we're, getting, we're gonna do these things authentically and i guess for me what i'm looking forward to kind of CJ along your point is that diversity does not mean niche. Yes. Right. And I think we were seeing that a lot this year. We saw a spider verse saw black Panther. I'm going to count love Simon. Just yeah. For oh me, yeah. For me yeah, personally, being, you're right. Yeah, for personally being gay. It's like, Oh right. This is just like a normal wait, What? Shocking. <laughs> um, sorry. I'm just telling you now, Cameron. Um, no, but like it's, it's, we live in a post Hamilton world guys. <laughs> exactly. Right. And it's, and I'm not throwing away my shot. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was nice to watch something, watch a lot of movies that were designed for mass appeal. And in doing so, their specificity meant that it had a greater emotional impact. 100%. Yeah. And I, I think that, I mean, all three of those movies were movies that like gave me an emotional gut punch because it's, it's very specific. But in so, you can always find something to connect to too absolutely yeah and it doesn't just have to be how they look for me that wasn't the what mattered there it was like oh right it's a human story and it also means that universal. someone else who didn't ever get to see themselves on screens got to absolutely and i was still able to enjoy it guys crazy thought but now <laughs> someone else got to appreciate it that much more and that's what matters i would i would really hate for us to end this podcast without touching on stanley's cameo oh yeah 
Um, what, well, let Cameron yeah, answer yeah, the sorry, question sorry, sorry. first. Oh, I, I, oh gosh, I didn't have an answer to that. that was oh, well, you so you just set it up. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I was kind of hoping I, I could fall into the background. <laughs> I, I do. I do want to throw in this my one last idea of post credit scene. If they could have shoehorned in one more, I would have loved after all of this had happened. If it was just 10 seconds where Miles went back. And his dad was watching over him as he peeled off all of his stickers. Yeah. Because well, like, they set that up. And I wanted, I wanted to, like, after he becomes this hero, he still has yeah. to do the work. Well, I mean, like, they do kind of hint at that when he goes, I put a sticker where my father won't yeah. be able to tell yeah. me to take yeah, it yeah. down. So, like, they do acknowledge that. But you're right. I, that, I definitely want that scene now. Mm-hmm. Just Miles going around, taking off all the little. <laughs> I, I do want to say, too, that I did see an article saying that there's some talks about creating a Spider-Verse television series. So we might yeah. die a little further into that world. I heard something about a TV series. There's talks about a sequel to focus mm-hmm. on Miles and Gwen. There's talk about a, a spinoff that would be Gwen plus then two other Spider Women, one called Silk and the one her name is Jessica Drew. Um, down for all of that. Yeah. Well, and then also you know the there's the potential of the post credit sting with yeah. Spider Man 2099, which yeah. again talking about diversity, that is a character who is both Hispanic and Irish. His name yeah. is Miguel O'Hara. Yeah. And it's like oh. <laughs> awesome yeah like let's see more of him too yeah no i thought i thought that was great and again when i saw that um after credit scene i was like they are literally they are trying if you haven't gotten the point anyone anyone can can do it this is like this is like if we haven't let you know by now there is no limitations to who you can be um but also i kind of wanted on that scene i wanted to bring up we've talked about a little bit how this movie was meta but I also love the merging of not only previous knowledge of Spider-Man, but the culture of Spider-Man, i.e. memes, meme oh, culture yeah. and everything. The, the, and Spider-Man the, the pointing. Christmas songs. The Christmas, the Christmas songs. songs. There's just so much that uh, it really showed, like, as you pointed out, what it's like to have a franchise or a brand and the different ways that that gets influenced. And I loved that... Um, they did like the the Spider Man meme or like mm-hmm. the office joke and like there's just so much that Spider Man has gotten bigger than just the movies themselves and they still acknowledge that in, uh, within this movie. Yeah, and the fact that some of the movies have gotten kind of crazy too and they throw that in there, yeah. just totally comfortable with it, and also Doing like a dance. Al- always like subverting <laughs> it too. It's like you asked the question earlier of oh is this the Tobey Maguire version it's very similar but they change things up so like the upside down kiss it's Mary Jane is hanging upside down it's like when he's having uh, lunch with her and you can actually see a hint of Doc Ock in the background through the car instead of it like crashing through he just turns around and punches it yeah Yeah. those sort of things Um, but you want to talk about like Stan Lee and you know his whole message there is basically like oh you know it'll fit eventually yeah it always fits and how just it's that's I mean I think it has even greater impact because he did pass away. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's almost kind of like if they have any more, I kind of want them to just cut it. Like, can we just have that be the final one? Because a lot of them get cheesy. And that well, was they really said, sweet. I think this is the last voiceover version that they had. And they said that once he died, they actually extended his scene a little bit longer mm-hmm. to add a little bit more weight to it because that it's not only is it his final one, but like the message that he's saying again, Stan Lee to just give Stan Lee credit. He is responsible for the world actually opening up their eyes and understanding, you know, he told stories of racism or integration or homophobia through these characters, through the X-Men, through Spider-Man, through different ways. Um, And again, so many people were able to connect and learn lessons. And so to have his final uh, voiceover, at least, appearance, being something so integral, which is anyone can be the hero, anyone can wear this suit. Um, It's about owning up to the responsibility of it, I think was just absolutely beautiful. And then to do so and then hit it with a joke. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Which is so (laughs) Stanley. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's probably his best or certainly one of his best cameos across the whole thing all right so anyone else we got to wrap this up No, i think we can wrap it up all right so i mean pretty much you guys is there anything uh to take your words is there anything you want to plug or is there anything that um (laughs) i don't know if i have anything to to plug yeah but to plug necessarily i guess we can (laughs) plug ourselves if you'll forget the expression um yeah so we we did tell us you were gay earlier that's true hey why not i mean where do you think bat plugs came from (laughs) we actually had someone on twitter recently ask us is that just a joke off butt plugs like yes we are children (laughs) we did that 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it's our podcast, Tim Talk. It's Tim with two M's. Uh, you know, it's all about basically 20, 25 year old DC comics cartoons. But we, we talk about a lot of other stuff along the way, too. Like you said, we just did an episode of Mary Poppins. We do all kinds of stuff. Um, and you can find us on iTunes and Spotify. And then if you want to sub- subscribe, and then if you want to just follow our accounts, we're at Tim Talk Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. You can tell every side of this a lot. <laughs> um, I'm personally at Lordifer on Twitter and Instagram. And then I have another podcast, because, you know, who, you need more of them always, uh, called Gay of Forward, where I'm being slowly taught how to be a better gay by our friend Jonathan. <laughs> yeah. um, and we have a few episodes out on uh, that. Most people don't know. It does come with lessons. <laughs> it does. Yeah, exactly. No one gave me the goddamn manual. Uh, it did, yours didn't come? <laughs> no, it, it never It never showed up. You got to, to switch your address. I think that's what it was. Uh, it went to the wrong address. It was a whole you problem. Got to do, you got to use the Amazon Prime. You got to <laughs> two-day uh, shipping. Damn it. See, if someone gave me the manual, I'd know these things. Um, but yeah, so we are, uh, yeah, gate forward pod on some of the things and gate forward on other things. I forget that. I don't actually recite that one at the end, yeah. but you'll find it out there. It's fun. So, uh, for, for regular plugs, um, young justice season three just started on DC universe. It's fantastic for anyone that loved the original franchise. It's just more of what you enjoy. Uh, I highly recommend if you have DC Universe, I understand a lot of people don't. I also forget that it's only in America still, which is very <laughs> dumb, but not my place to say. Uh, if you want to, yeah, yeah, I'm also part of Tim Talk, as we've said at the top and in the middle and now at the end. Uh, if you want to find my stuff, I am I, I do art. I'm an animator. I, if you want to see that stuff, you can find that on my art page, uh, Cameron.Dexter on Instagram and only Instagram because I only care about Instagram. Uh, and if you want to see my face, it's at Cameron.Dexter. Cameron Dexter underscore adventures. That one. Right? She did it. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll wrap us up uh, by saying thank you for listening to Bro Meets World. Remember, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Pod, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, all of the places. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and all of the places at Bro Meets World or email us at Bro Meets World at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Extra Siege. That's X T R A C E E J, Tonothy. You can find me on Instagram at TheBraverMe at dot braver dot me. Um, you can also find me in theaters next week probably being disappointed by glass <laughs> hey hey <laughs> i i have faith but you know what i think i mean that's misplaced yeah. so, you know what? <laughs> to, to, to steal uh, leap of faith leap of faith, <laughs> leap of faith. Yes. <laughs> leap of faith have a leap of faith maybe it'll be okay i'm hoping so i'm really i really am to, to steal from their podcast i love uh every day is christmas eve when it comes to movies you don't know what you're gonna get Ooh, Ooh. who said that it's the empire podcast oh i'm here for it yeah yeah, yeah it's that. fantastic but that. you know sometimes the gift is socks <laughs> <laughs> so be prepared okay uh thank you guys yeah i mean they could be nice socks that's camera oh I, as a, i now love socks as a gift i've as gotten an adult. a variety of socks from m night Shyamalan, so <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting <laughs> Oh, is that it? Are you good? Yeah, yeah, that's it. All right, later, bros. Later, bruh.